Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Very, very excited to talk to you about your take on follow-up. So yeah. um, without further ado, can you mind just doing a quick intro for those of the few folks that don't know you? Sure. Uh, my name is Matt Hines, uh, founder and president of a company called Hines Marketing, and we're basically just B2B sales and marketing consultants. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to pick your brain on more on the sales side of things, but feel free to you know, answer any which way you, poss- uh, you can or want to. Um, what's, you know, to, before we jump into the weeds, like, what is generally your, your approach or your rule of thumb when it comes to following up? Uh, I mean, you have to provide value to the recipient every single time, right? I mean, I think a lot of follow-ups and, you know, if you're in sales and marketing, you probably get a lot of these in your inbox. Someone sends you an email and then says, hey, just following up or, hey, wanted to make sure you saw that email or, hey, just putting this at the top of your inbox. None of that provides value for me as a prospect, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So if you know your prospect well enough, if you know their issues, if you know what they like, put something of interest in that follow-up. You know, if you're trying to get someone to learn about GDPR, for example, uh, you know, based on a solution you can provide for them, like put a new link to a GDPR article in the top of the email um, when you're following up or, you know, pay attention to what the prospect is doing relative to a particular topic and respond to that. What they did say, hey, congrats. I saw that you put your you updated your privacy policy. Glad you guys are working through the, the GDPR compliance regulations. So make it value added, make it about the prospect. Um, that's the way that you actually get attention on those follow up emails. Gotcha. Now that's super, very, very important. I think that is actually my biggest pet peeve is like, I just want to follow up, have to be value add. And I think, you you know, to reiterate, like the words I just wanted to follow up is implied by you following up. So like you're saying what you're doing, you don't need to do that. That's right. Uh, Yeah. That's super smart. So always adding value, um, helpful content, I'm assuming, or or is probably something that that's there. Um, so uh, when you're doing follow-ups or if, you're, if you've received many follow-ups, like what's a, do you do anything to kind of supplement the email follow-ups or you know, how, how do you go about following up? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think people use email predominantly because it's easy, it's fast. It feels like you can just sit at your computer and type it. Um, but if you diversify the channels you use, you're much more likely to get someone's response. Uh, there's plenty of science and research that's shown that if you send five emails versus sending maybe two emails, leaving two voicemails, maybe touching someone across a social channel, the, the multi-channel effect, especially when you have an integrated message, a similar message and approach across each channel is much more likely to create awareness, to create interest and to drive a response. So follow-up does not mean just emailing and emailing and emailing. It means diversifying the channels you use uh, in an appropriate cadence. And when I say appropriate cadence, I mean, um, you know, based on, you know, what, what someone has requested of you, if they have asked for something of you and you're just trying to follow up, I think you are in the right to be more aggressive. You're trying to serve them based on something they asked for. Uh, if you're simply just cold calling, trying to get someone's attention, calling or emailing every day is going to be very annoying and come across as very aggressive. So I think you have to use common sense, uh, you know, in the cadences as well as the diversity of channels you want to use. Does your follow-up cadence or time frame d- differ for the different types of people you're emailing? Um, not necessarily different types of people, but it's the context of the relationship that I think would, that would change that. You know, if I'm following up with an IT administrator versus a CIO, I'm not necessarily going to change the frequency if I'm cold calling versus if I'm responding to a demo request. Um, but I think the nature of what they have requested makes a big difference. If I said, Hey, I want a demo. Uh, and then I get busy or I go into a fire drill, like I still want a demo. And so your persistence a little more frequently in getting me on that call is, is warranted. Like you're, you're providing a service at that point. Uh, if I haven't asked for anything or the middle ground, which I think people, people assume that when someone downloads a white paper that they're asking for a response. No, when I download a white paper from my perspective as the buyer, as the, as the uh, recipient of your messages, transaction over, I got my white paper and so I'm fine, right? I don't need to talk to you about the white paper. So you have to now, two, two things. One, you have to prove you have something of value beyond the white paper to say, hey, I, you know, you know, maybe you didn't get a chance to read that, but wanted to share with you some of the questions we get most often from other people that have engaged with that content, happy to share that information with you. Like that's something of incremental value based on what you started with, but you still can't call every day and say, I really want to get that information to you. I think, you know, spreading it out, you know, giving at least three to four, three to four business days between messages at that point. And then the point of diminishing returns, I believe is 
you know, three or four messages across, you know, uh, sort of two to three weeks, quite frankly, mm -hmm. if they haven't engaged at that point, they're probably not going to for that initial cadence. And I think you move on. So, you know, if you leave one voicemail and give up, then that's not worthwhile. If you leave 25 voicemails, not only are you pissing off the prospect, but you're also wasting your own time versus spending that time going after the next prospect. Yeah, that makes sense. I love how you're saying there's a, there's a middle ground to both extremes. Um, that totally makes sense. Um, and there is a point of, uh, a persistence versus annoyance. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's all kind of common sense at the end of the day of, of when you do what, right. Yep. Um, do you have any kind of from, from your personal experiences or, um, uh, your, your kind of, uh, your approach, what type of like, what, what's like the best follow-up strategy that's, that's gotten you some really good results? You know, I, I tend to, um, I, I tend to have a, a set, uh, uh cadence that I use for follow-up. Uh, it's, it's 11 touches over uh, 14 business days. And so I, in it, and by, and it's not 11 of the same channel. It's like, you know, leave a voicemail, follow up email, wait a couple days, do a social touch, wait a couple days, do a voicemail, email touch again. So a lot of our prospects we have built in that, you know, we use a sales engagement platform when inbound leads come in that we sort of put people onto those cadences. It's, it ties into our CRM. Uh, so I think having that consistency is important. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for the organization to be a little more streamlined and process driven for how you do follow up, but also customizing follow up to the nature of what comes in. We have probably 15 different cadences we use in our sales engagement platform based on whether someone came in and asked, you know, it was a contact us lead that we haven't gotten a hold of, whether they downloaded a particular webinar, where they accessed a particular white paper, whether they just signed up for our newsletter list, we have one of those. Um, so I think the context is always different, but the cadence structure can be similar. Gotcha. That makes sense. And what, what tools do you guys use or what's the software you use for, uh, the follow up, the social engagement, or is it, is it a hodgepodge of things? It's a combination of things for sure. Um, you know, uh, one of them is the telephone. One of them is email, right? I think yeah. that you know, we do use outreach uh, as a bolt on to outlook, uh, you know, to send a lot of the, to, to set up a lot of those cadences. Um, you know, we use Sprout social, uh, to coordinate a lot of our um, our social media engagement. And then all of that is coordinated within Salesforce. So we have, you know, one CRM system that sort of manages all those activities and everything plugs in. So I can see an activity history with that particular prospect. Gotcha. Totally makes sense. Awesome. All right. So I've got one more question for you. Uh, what is the, what is the best follow-up sequence or follow-up email or phone call, whatever? What's the, what's, what's the best follow-up you've seen or you've received? Yeah. I, there's, um, there's a copywriter uh, out of Boston and uh, she was, she's basically trying to get work, right? So she's copywriter for hire and wanted to see if we had some work on some of our clients. And, um, you know, she, she was, she's constantly writing and she's, and she will say, Hey, based on what you, um, based on what you write about, I just wrote something for another client. I thought you might find interesting, right? So she's sharing her copy, but she's also sort of saying like, this might be something of value to you. Uh, one of the best things she did in one of her follow-ups though, she had a PS line and it said, Hey PS, um, I'm coming to Seattle in August and, uh, and I live in Seattle. And she said, I'm coming to Seattle in August and I love pizza. What's your favorite pizza joint? Like who's not going to respond to that, right? It's sort of a non sequitur yeah. at the end of the email. And you're like, oh, I love pizza. And, you know, if you haven't been to North Lake Tavern, you totally have to go because they have like pictures of frozen daiquiris and their pizzas are this tall and they're fantastic. So it got me to respond outside of the business requests and it got me to sort of build some rapport around pizza. Um, so I thought that nice. tactic was really, really good. I love it. And, you know, that reminds me uh, is the humanizing of, of, of an emails or conversations um, she never, she didn't ask he or she didn't ask you for, uh, to meet you mm -hmm. in August. They, they yeah. said like, I'm coming, which kind of yeah. opens the door of like, maybe you want to meet, right. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe they may follow up again if you engage properly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a human to human connection. Um, so I love that. It's so, it's so smart. I, I, um, that's one of my favorite things actually to do is when I'm traveling somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, I email, I, I try to find one anchor person that I know. Yeah, um, and then I or I, I'm like organize a dinner or something like that with, with like marketing influencers. Uh, I think I've pinged you once or twice. I should have probably stayed more, followed up a little bit more. There but you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, you, no. Anyways, not to call you out there, but but yeah, like like get the person, then you just keep following up and, and humanize yeah. that that relationship. So uh, I think it's it's very very powerful. So Matt, thank you for your time. Where can yeah. people find you? Uh, you just find us at HeinzMarketing.com, H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com. Uh, I'm just Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at HeinzMarketing.com and on Twitter at, at HeinzMarketing. 
Awesome. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you.